it's very simply, I help people restore safety to their nervous systems. So that when people like talk the talk of from surviving to thriving, like forget about it. That's that's unrealistic. From early years in our life, right? We come into this world, we're born, okay? We're conceived and we're born. We don't get to choose whose arms we land in. And we don't get to choose like what state they're actually in and how well they can actually nurture us and nurture that sense of safety within our nervous systems from that very early age. And as babies, we determine life through our felt senses. Our cognitive mind isn't developed. We don't think like we think as adults. We feel, we sense, and we know how dependent we are on our caregivers. So what that brings into us is we kind of learn how to survive. We know we learn how to work towards having our needs met in ways that um, may not really serve us as we step into adulthood. And when we're unconscious of those, we can be unconsciously living life in survival all the time without even realizing it. Wow. I think when you take it back to newborn that eight pounds and six ounces and you say, okay, this is the big, this is your beginning. You're welcome to the world. But then what happens to you, Mm. what the nurturing and the everything that you experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We learn how to, to survive. We're wired for survival and self-preservation a hundred percent let's talk about the work uh, that you do with 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 the people you serve yeah with the guy like when when somebody comes to me and they start telling their story okay Mm -hmm. my job is to really listen and then from there it's to shine a little light on when you're telling this story, how is it feeling in your body? Okay, so is it increasing your heart rate? Can you feel your thoughts begin to race? Do you notice how things start bouncing all around the place? Do you feel grounded? Do you feel centered? Do you feel connected to this story? And where within you is that strongest connection? And then from there, we kind of gently weave them towards feeling grounded, feeling that centeredness in themselves. And then I begin to ask them, if you were to tell the story from this place, how differently would it be told? And it's this subtle awakening of how this conditioning It's like this invisible hand that molds our perceptions. It molds our our thoughts. It molds our energy. And it really molds the direction which we um, travel our lives through. And when we know that we can actually like change this direction with some sense of reconnecting with these felt senses, which are deeply connected with our very younger being, then we get to collect ourselves in a completely different way. Because as you said, and how you said, like the the angel and the saboteur, the job of the saboteur is really to prevent you from feeling the pain that you felt as a child. Right. Right, exactly. So when we can like kind of highlight the fact that it's really trying to protect you, it's coming in as this sense of protection, defense. So you've moved away from this ability to connect deeply with your authentic self. You've gone into complete defense mode. The barriers are going up. Those survival strategies are well in place and are active. And... So 
very slowly and gently, I begin to try and show them the vast ground between that angel and that saboteur. So that we can start walking ourselves back to that middle ground where we can meet ourselves with compassion, with understanding. And when we bring it in through the framework of the nervous system, it gives us something tangible for things that just sometimes just don't make sense. Why does this always happen? Why do I react this way? And for a lot of people, they get that sense that this is not appropriate for this time and place. Where are these thoughts coming from? What just happened to the ground that I felt beneath me? Where did it go all of a sudden? Right? Yeah. So they begin to be able to connect it to this innate, wonderful like piece of you know, engineering that's within us that has brought us this far. And then we get to that point of starting asking those questions. None of this is making sense. Why am I still stuck? Why are these patterns still here? I've tried talking about it. I've tried all of these things. And then I ask, have you turned towards your nervous system? Because these early core beliefs are very attached to our stress responses. And like, as you might even communicate with me, and like, there may be something that you say that maybe might trigger that early core belief. Say for me, I had this sense that I wasn't welcome. And you've made me feel very welcome here today. All right. But over the years, I've learned how very quickly that can come in. And how I can like maybe begin to get a little shaky. And so there's my flight response. I start looking for an escape. You know, sorry, I'm out of time. <laughs> I've got to go. <laughs> I gotta go. Right? It's over. <laughs> you I know, guess, because um, that's that's what the can like when we are in condition mode, that's how powerful it is. And then when we don't realize how, how much they drive our thoughts, our energy, our behaviors, our actions, then we are constantly um, letting it take the lead where that we can actually help unveil that unconsciousness through reconnecting with the sensations that arrive within us, because that's the language that our early childhood is trying to communicate with us through. It's not trying to keep us small. It's actually trying to help us heal. And when we can readapt our thoughts into like responding to what is arising as a form of healing intelligence rather than an obstacle or this thing that we have to get rid of. Um, it just changes our own conversation with ourselves and our own understanding of ourselves as like this whole other kind of being in a way and a whole different way of interacting with the world, with the people around us, with what's inside us with what's happening in the moment that's amazing i often in in coaching sessions people use the word transformative in just seven minutes or so of you talking you've changed the saboteur from a hurt me into a help me that is such a different way of thinking about the saboteur the imagery throughout recent human history is you put an angel on this side and you put a little devil with the pitchfork on the other shoulder yeah. <laughs> and that's the narrative that we've from fairy tales to stories to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the narrative and what you just did, you talked about the stressors, you talked about being triggered, you talked about all that being connected to the nervous system and the sensations we feel in the moment. And it's not that we should run for the exit when we feel them. In the healing intelligence, as you called it, in that moment, 
we should acknowledge that it was there to protect us maybe long ago. And that now um, we can change the story that we tell ourselves about it. That's exactly it. Wow. I'll just say wow. <laughs> because, yeah. and this is, I think this is why I I really wanted to talk to you because I think in, in our first conversation I had, my fascination in that moment was about the, we took a deeper dive into the nervous system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I had not had that conversation before. I, I think of the autonomic nervous system. That's exactly it. But that is it. Yeah. Right. It's anything automatic. So anything automatic, we have those automatic thoughts, those automatic rea- reactions. We have those automatic feelings that come in when we're close to certain people or when we hear certain things. And um, anything like anything automatic is very much connected to the nervous system. It is like the storage unit of all your experiences. And of course, it's connected to the brain, our limbic system, the lower limbic system. So our amygdala, our threat center, our memory center. A lot of times the memories don't even make it there. And all we're left is all these physical sensations from something that happened where we didn't even get to complete the cycle of activation, the fear that came in. And so it stays within the system. And anything that's similar that arises from then on triggers the cycle, the activation. But what that's really asking us to do is to stay with it long enough to help clear the activation so that the body can actually get the message that it's over, that's past, that's gone. It's like letting the air out of a balloon. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. And, And instead of it going pop, right? Because some people's awakening can, can really like floor them and really kind of shatter them. And where I come in is that, in some ways it was like that for me. And what really brought me to this work was like going, okay, there has got to be a better way of doing this. Where that no matter where people are, this does not have to shatter them even more. That they can see the shattered pieces and start picking them up And I start putting these puzzle pieces back together. But not to a point of where all these pieces are scattered so far away that it takes you years to start to to really collect it and put it back. And that's that's really (laughs) why my heart and soul is in this work. Because I know that pain. That pain of having that balloon just completely burst. It's like you think you have your, your life made out. You've already put your puzzle pieces in, right? And maybe you've squashed a few in along the way. (laughs) (laughs) But it's like literally somebody comes and like takes their hand and flips it. And it's like, whoa. The thing about knowing you, Roseanne, is the through line of what I know about your story is that nursing is what precedes the work that you do. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and nursing, most of us have this perception. If we're not a nurse, we have this perception. We see nurses in the hospital oh, or in the doctor's office. Oh, look, a nurse. But we often we don't know the trauma that you see every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's, that's another conversation um, I just wanted to to mention that to the listening audience mm-hmm. so they know that this is not an avocation that you came to like, oh my gosh, I can help people this way. You were helping people that way, which informs the need to help people this way. So it's a continuum and a deep and abiding thread that runs through your story of being in service to other people. Absolutely. And thank you for like bringing me back to that because 
I've always said a common thread in what I've done is just that I deeply care about people. And something that even in my um, student nurses days were like how afraid people can feel. And like, I mean, when you're being picked up by this off the side of the road, I did EMS for a little while too, or you're arriving into a, you know, an emergency department or you're sitting in the bed before a big procedure. People are afraid. Yeah. The unknown, what's going to happen. Yeah. What's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, you know, that whole image of like when a patient reaches out to hold your hand and they really want you to tell them they're going to be okay. And you don't know that they're going to be okay. And they can sense when you're not being honest, <laughs> right? Yeah, that is yeah. that case of being able to just sit with them and say, we may not know the outcome, but right now you're here, we're talking and you're doing okay. And when you can go in to any procedure with that in mind, rather than fear, number one, it impacts your ability to recover. It impacts how you are lying on that table, even, even with your, your mask on and you're under anesthetic, like that ability to already bring a felt sense of safety. You can't put that inside somebody, but when you can truly ground yourself in that belief, their body can feel it with yours. It's like your nervous system communicates with mine. Mine communicates with yours. There, it's always listening. And it's always in search, not only of the threat and danger, but it's always in search of that person. You know how you can just walk into a room and suddenly you start talking to somebody and you just have a great conversation and you're like, going, wow, versus walking into the room and you're like, going, OK, I need to leave this room yes, yeah. for whatever reason. So it's always at play. Both sides are always at play. And it's like for for, I, I still remember like um, this person, he's literally his head went through the windscreen of his car. And like for four hours, he was stuck with me <laughs> as, <laughs> as, as I, you know, he had to go for his x-ray. We had to get like, where are the glass shards? Where do we begin? And he's lying face down, looking at my shoes. And I'm going, why didn't I polish my shoes today? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like having that conversation as the scalp was the scalp, you know, the you know, the forceps is, is touching the glass shards and you're like, OK, how are you feeling? You're keeping the conversation going. And it's like how quickly they can forget that they are in pain. Yeah. Oh, what just happened? It, and the recovery, no matter what, is always the first few moments when you are in that threatened state. The first person you meet those first few moments create the biggest impact it's like the oxygen it's like if you're not breathing we gotta get oxygen on you but it's also that felt sense of somebody's got me and i feel safe right now with this person and it just changes the landscape but you know it sounds the like has already begun <laughs> it's, it sounds like it sounds like being being grounded or, or feeling grounded I, I we in the green room before we we came on live. I was talking about my early morning experience. On some mornings, is going to the well manicured soccer fields here in the desert that are about a five minute walk from me. And and at sunrise, I will go out. Uh, I have my shoes on, but when I'm doing tai chi, my intention is to feel grounded. Mm -hmm. And that grounding and the breathing that I do just makes me feel complete, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and grounding, we, different people reach that, that feeling in different ways, meditation, journaling, um, exercise. Mm -hmm. You early in our dialogue today, you first talked about we all come with a story and the work that you do helps them change the story to something that serves them in, in a new and positive way. Here's a question. How does grounding and being grounded, I see a yoga mat behind you when I think of mm. yoga as another exercise that, that we use to feel grounded. Mm. 
talk about what it means to be grounded and how that inserts itself into the work that you do okay. or, or how, how that serves the people that, that you work with. Yeah. Yeah. So there's many kind of different interpretations and understanding of being grounded, feeling grounded. And an approach that I like to bring to it is a lot of times people think of groundedness as like their feet on the ground. Right. And then I'll kind of move them a little further into their bodies and go, how, like, where does this level of groundedness begin? So if it's literally you're, you're feeling your feet on the ground, that's a great start. We can go a little deeper. So it's like you're leaving a deeper footprint. So it's like you're standing on a beautiful, fresh, mossy bed of, of the most purest forest. And it's like your footprint just drops. But imagine feeling grounded from here. But not to a point of inertia to a point where you can feel this safety with yourself and within yourself. Because that's transforming it into an embodied, a whole embodied sense that your nervous system can begin to relate to. Because you're, you're, what you're trying to do is let this message get as far as the brain so that it can like settle that threat center and when we can think of groundedness as like being this whole body thing and not just our feet but also how we can use if we're feeling really shaky on the inside because that can be really difficult for people to even come into their body because there can be just too much noise in the body to even begin to like go oh, forget that and then it makes them even more agitated. So hence where meditation and mindfulness can sometimes work in the opposite direction for people. So it's that ability to use all of your senses, not just your feet. We can do something like this. We can look around the room we're in. We can take in the truth of this very moment. And to me, groundedness is feeling at home in this present moment, fully at home and fully with what is arising within this moment while still being connected to that within the nervous system language and polyvagal language is called the ventral vagal state. So that whatever's going on, you still feel anchored to yourself and not just to the ground beneath you. So whether you're sitting on a boat, you're 40,000 feet in the air, all these little analogies, it's like, it's really this connection and anchoring deep within you. But it begins with these subtleties of feeling your feet on the ground, but taking it deeper, of taking in everything that feels basically okay right now. Look around the space you're in. There's the clock. There's the picture. I've got water. There's food in the refrigerator. So it's like, it's a whole, it's not just this thing that's outside of you. It's in here. And the more you cultivate it, it basically means that it's always available to you. And the more it's available to you, the more available you remain. Wow. That's beautiful. What you just described is it's an inside out practice. I I introduced the, the question by talking about by being grounded doing my Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. I ignite it, trigger, trigger the grounding experience only after the pranayama, the breathing. When mm -hmm. I finally get that in rhythm and it kicks in, then it's like all systems are are engaged. There you go. And it's yeah. it's it's working from the inside out. And and that is when I I can really feel settled and and feel grounded. So I think but I think as you suggested, it's different for different people. I know people that will will just 
try to feel the fingerprint on their finger and mm -hmm. just that moment of concentration. Mm -hmm. And it's been explained to me that it works for them in the moment where you meet somebody and they say something that triggers you and mm -hmm. you can, in an unobtrusive way, just start mm -hmm. feeling that finger to bring yourself back into your body, mm -hmm. to, to bring yourself to, to lower, to tell the nervous system, just calm down. Mm -hmm. I know you're triggered, but you feel that fingerprint, it's just me and you here. This is, this is, this, we're going to deal with this mm -hmm. and, and we're going to engage our empathy mm -hmm. instead of our anger. Mm -hmm. And we all have the ability to find our control, our fingerprint, our breathing, our looking yeah. at the colors in the room. Yeah. And it's a practice that we humans can practice. And there's a there's a, a process called deliberate practice. It means that you you reach for the goal, but in order to achieve the goal, you find a coach that can help you achieve the goal that perhaps has done the practice that you seek. And that's why Roseanne Riley exists, because she's the coach that you can call when it's time for you to acknowledge that that saboteur and that angel on your shoulders um, are not necessarily uh, the help me and the hurt me. You have to understand the saboteur and its intention um, was once upon a time a positive thing. And it's a conversation perhaps mm -hmm. that you have. There's so much more that I want to talk to Roseanne about and um, and her connection to nursing, which she gave us a little sense of how that informs the work she does today. And and I'm going to ask Roseanne to come back so we can have that conversation because I know for the listening audience and myself, every time I talk to you, Roseanne, I learn something different about the human condition and and how simply thinking about my narrative is not etched in stone. If I change the story, I can change the way I think about my future and in the way I think about myself and change my story. I can change my world, but my story in some ways is connected to my, it informs how my nervous system responds to the world around me. And so it's not just changing the words you use to describe your moment or yourself. It's understanding how it all works together. And mm -hmm. so as an expert guide, listening audience, you've been introduced to Roseanne Riley. Here she is um, waiting to serve you and help you accomplish more in whatever your endeavor is. And Roseanne, thank you for joining you. me to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. The beginning of these conversations. Absolutely. absolutely. I yeah. think she just said she's yeah. coming back. She just, <laughs> we, we, we're going to hold her feet to the fire. She's coming yes. back. Yeah. We've, we've got to include the upregulating of the nervous system too. Oh, there yeah. we go. We've got mm -hmm. a new, another chapter, another page to yes. turn there so you as, go. as we learn how to engage with our nervous system. So thank you so much. This has been Beautiful. wonderful. Beautiful. Thank you too, Arthur. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's been absolutely. Bye for now.